<laughs> Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawati Hami. In today's program, we are going to talk about the presidential campaign that is underway in the United States of America. The presidential elections to be held in November. Two leading candidates, the Democrat and the incumbent president, Joe Biden, and the former president, Donald Trump, who survived an assassination attempt on Saturday during a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania. And uh, he appeared... Uh, at the Republican National Convention today uh, with a huge welcome by supporters and delegates. Also, uh, there have been uh, multiple media reports which uh, suggest that there has been a talk and pressure on the incumbent president, Democrat Joe Biden, to step aside and uh, let somebody else contest the presidential election against Donald Trump, but he has categorically on a number of times said that he is not going anywhere. Also, uh, this particular uh, incident that happened with uh, Donald Trump on Saturday, uh, what sort of an impact that particular incident uh, would have on the overall presidential campaign till the polls happen in November? Also, when we talk about the chances of uh, uh, President Joe Biden stepping aside, uh, would that be considered uh, something that could be done at this particular point in time? And what sort of impact it would have on the presidential election campaign for a Democrat's candidate? Let me bring in our panelists to discuss the presidential campaign underway in the U.S. We are honored to have been joined in the studio of Mr. Saeed Khalid, his former ambassador. Mr. Khalid, thank you very much for your time, for being with us on the show tonight. We really appreciate that. Mr. Khalid, when we talk about the incident that happened on Saturday, uh, first of all, your thoughts regarding that? Is there any sort of place for violence as far as politics is concerned? Uh, we've seen uh, former President Donald Trump escaping this particular assassination attempt very narrowly. It is a, a sad, uh, you know, commentary that uh, the gun culture in America and violence in America, this is uh, something we live on on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are mass shootings and, and people dying, you know, in large number, in thousands every year. And there's a, a, a big, you know, heated debate always between the uh, <clears throat> between the defendants of the gun culture and those who think that this has gone too way, too much out of control, and it's you know affecting the American society. Uh, it is therefore not a surprise that a young man who picks up a gun, supposedly bought by his father, a rifle, uh, since it's freely available. And he comes and takes, uh, uh, you know, uh, selects a place mm -hmm. and uh, takes a target on none else than Donald Trump. Um, it's, a, it's a sad commentary, I think. Not that it, it doesn't happen in other countries. It, it happens everywhere. But the way uh, it is done easily in America, mm. it, it is a bit baffling. Uh, okay, so uh, after this particular assassination attempt and uh, Donald Trump, uh, Trump uh, surviving this particular assassination attempt, now looking at this particular today, he appeared at the Republican National Convention with a huge welcome of the supporters and the delegates. What sort of an Im impact do you think this particular incident might have on the overall uh, the election campaign of President, former President Trump? What we are hearing is that uh, it can help him tremendously. And uh, it can, uh, you know, lead to a, a big wave of sympathy for him. Already he is very popular. And um, I think his supporters will be more galvanized by this. And it's even being said that this uh, <clears throat> attack on Donald Trump, uh, he was not hit so much as, as uh, President Joe Biden will be in the election. Okay, so the, uh, do you think there have been two back-to-back -back setbacks for uh, President Joe Biden? Firstly, the dismal performance, as well as the first presidential election debate was concerned. And now this particular incident, if it is going to galvanize more supporters and voters uh, for uh, former President Donald Trump. You know, so I, do you I, see I may be wrong, but the impression, general impression is that uh, Joe Biden is in dire straits as far as the campaign is concerned. 
And we have now August, September, October, three, a little over three months left. And um, one doesn't really know how he can improve his uh, ratings, how he can uh, convince you know, uh, people that he's up to the job despite his you know, advanced age. Uh, uh, right, uh, let me bring in uh, another panelist into the discussion. On Sky, we are honored to have been joined by Mr. Athar Tirimzi, senior analyst, is joining us from the U.S. Mr. Tirimzi, thank you very much for your time, for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about that uh, unfortunate incident that happened on Saturday, the assassination attempt on the life of former President Donald Trump. Uh, first of all, your thoughts regarding... Uh, is there any sort of place of such violence as far as the uh, politics in the United States of America is concerned? Also, what sort of an impact it is going to have on the overall uh, presidential election campaign for President Trump? Thank you, much. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, first of all, I think uh, both parties, both Republicans and Democrats, came out uh, very strongly condemning the violence. Uh, United States, uh, you know, we look at ourselves as uh, the civil society that leads the world in democracy and democratic values. So to have an assassination of attempt on a presidential candidate who's also a former president, I think that should be condemned. And not only the United States, I think, you know, anywhere in the world, uh, United States uh, is leading the charge by saying that, you know, there is no room for political violence, specifically in the United States. As far as the issue of will it help or hurt, I think uh, there's going to be a bump, of course, and it just so happened that the assassination attempt happened and it was all over the news. So there was a sympathy vote, which came just a day or two before the Republican National Convention, which was going to give Donald Trump the nomination, as well as a bump in the national polls. So I think uh, it will definitely help him. It won't hurt him at all. Uh, the challenges for a Biden campaign uh, from the get-go was how to get around. And as you had mentioned, there was a very dismal performance at the first debate. And I had mentioned once before, too, that, of course, one debate or two debates uh, you know, in presidential campaign um, uh, necessarily don't make up a lot of people's minds, and people have a very short-term memory. So election is, is still August, September, October, November, three, you know, three and a half months away, um, four months away. I think people have a short-term memory in an election cycle because so much news comes at them, and it comes so fast that will this debate have an impact? Uh, maybe a little bit, but the challenge for Biden campaign is how to consistently be on the message. And I'll tell you, uh, whether it's a Republican campaign strategist, uh, former President Donald Trump himself, or the team, they're very, very good at marketing. Uh, their simple message is, let's make America wealthy again. And they're talking about prosperity at a personal level. I think that is so hard to, whether you like him or don't like him, that message resonates with everybody. Because when people in America who are struggling with groceries and home prices and stuff like that, when you go and say, like, would you want more money in your pocket, there's not a single American that would say no to. So I think their messaging uh, is the key right now, which Democratic Party is off. Absolutely. So uh, uh, you already mentioned that uh, people have got very short-term memory. There's so much information that is flowing at this particular point in time with uh, just a couple of months uh, left um, as far as those polls in November are concerned. Uh, when we talk about the dismal performance by President Joe Biden at the first presidential debate and now this particular assassination attempt which former President Donald Trump has survived. Also, the federal judge dismisses Trump's classified documents case also. So these three developments back to back, do you consider all these uh, huge setbacks for any chances for President uh, Joe Biden to make a substantial gain uh, during the presidential campaign till November? So I, if, if I have to put an analogy, it's a 100-meter dash where Trump was already 10 meter ahead of Biden. And now he got three more meters, right? That's the analogy I would put at, that 
Now Biden is starting at 10 meters behind Trump, now is 13 meters behind, and he's not at the best of his strength. So absolutely every single setback is a major setback because you have to understand on the Democratic side, people are not unfortunately energized about Joe Biden, even the Democrats, right? So when you have a candidate that people already are not energized, and then you have another candidate, opposing candidate, who just keeps getting these small victories, it definitely hurts the Democratic campaign. And again, uh, you know, President Biden has come out and still have said no. Uh, a lot of people are also not excited if Kamala Harris would be a better choice to replace Biden. So there is a lot of conversation happening within the Democratic voters and donors. Uh, but these victories on the Donald Trump's campaign. To hold you for a second over here, in that particular case, in that particular case, uh, first of all, it has been categorically said a number of times by President Joe Biden that is not going anywhere. So in that particular case, so what are the chances, the kind of media reports that we are getting, there has been a lot of pressure as to the concern regarding his age. Perhaps he's not going to deliver to the expectations as far as the final outcome of the elections is concerned. So if he's going to stick with the candidacy and his goal uh, goes into the final polls also as a presidential candidate for the Democrats. So uh, in that case, what are the chances? What do you foresee sitting over there in the U.S.? And secondly, if he does step aside, does step aside at this particular point in time, is it going to give any sort of a gain to the Democrats? And who is going to be possibly the best alternative at this particular time? Look, I think it's unfortunately a loss loss situation for Democrats from what I'm looking at. If you look at it, um, Don, you know, Joe Biden not you know moving aside, President Biden has said unequivocally that I'm not going anywhere. His performance of the debate was really dismal. Uh, United States is, is still suffering from very, very high inflation. And the messaging for Democratic parties is still off. So all these three fronts, Democrats are already losing. Now, with the, now combine that with Donald Trump's, uh, you know, uh, popularity, it's going to hurt Biden's campaign already. I, I think it's going to be very hard for Biden to win. Uh, one thing that a Biden campaign, and if, if somebody were to replace this late, it is so hard to build a momentum in three to four months to replace. It just seems chaotic. And there'll be a lot of chaos because uh, I'll tell you, in uh, 2020, the total money raised between Joe Biden and Donald Trump was around $1.4 billion. So U.S. elections are not easy and not cheap. So for somebody to replace Joe Biden, now, how are you going to haul seven, eight hundred million dollars in very short amount of time? It's not that it's impossible, but I just don't see who is an alternate, who is right on message, who can definitely take Donald Trump on also, right? Because it's not just replacing, it's taking on Donald Trump and creating that energy in Democratic base. So I think it's very hard. Right, Mr. Trimzi, at the same time, there are voices that are still supporting uh, President Joe Biden that should be contesting the polls as a presidential candidate from the Democrats. A couple of them to be mentioned over here is uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, Ilhan Omar. How do you uh, look at that particular point of view from those uh, particular important people there? Well, uh, look, I think... Uh, there's always going to be party loyalists, and then there is a reality and a perception. Democratic Party also don't want to, they have a reality that they're realizing that maybe President Biden is not in the best of the state to lead the country for four more years. That's a reality. A lot of Democrats, forget about Republicans, a lot of Democrats feel that. But then the perception cannot be chaos as well. So if the reality and perception both become chaotic, it's going to become an extremely uphill battle. So I think that's a lot of damage control, internal politics, create perception that, look, people are standing behind President Biden. But privately, I'll tell you, a lot of Democratic voters are not happy with this choice. And again, um, if it's going to be President Joe Biden in November on the ballot, it is going to be voted against Donald Trump, not for President Biden. And that's, un that's the unfortunate reality of this, this year's election. As far as the last four years of uh, President Joe Biden's administration is concerned, wasn't there 
anything to capitalize upon to tell to the public that this is our greatest achievement over which they perhaps might have capitalized and perhaps uh, the presidential campaign for the Democrats could have had some uh, different picture altogether. Absolutely. But the problem is that those victories are very uh, compartmentalized, if you know were to say it. So, for example, you know, the first federal judge, Zahid Qureshi, was appointed by President Biden in the history of the United States. He's a Pakistani judge, um, you know, a very good friend of mine. Uh, he was appointed, and that made a history. Uh, you know, he had appointed a lot of firsts in terms of African-American, Latinos, and all that. But the problem is that once you get into the identity politics of victories, that, hey, we, we did something for Muslim Americans, we did something for um, Hispanic Americans, we did something for African Americans. Problem is that's not a generalized message. And these messages should be given, but these messages given at a specific time and place to a specific audience. Uh, their victories in terms of inflation, it's, it's a general message that affects everybody, whether you're black, whether you're white, Muslim, Christian, Jew, whoever you are, it affects everybody when it comes to inflation. And there is not a united message that inflation can be talked about. Groceries are still expensive. Cars are still expensive. Homes are still expensive. So they cannot talk about a general message. Yes, they can definitely talk about victories in a small, fragmented section. But that's not how you win election. You have to have a message for masses, as well as specific message for a specific community, because that do matter. But your message only is when about a specific community. It becomes extremely hard to create masses. Now, what they're banking on is that uh, J.D. Vance, who's the VP pick for uh, uh, President Biden, uh, President Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump, they were hoping that he does pick somebody like that because uh, it came down to between Marco Rubio and him, and one more. Marco Rubio was all a contender. They were uh, Democrats were hoping that Marco Rubio should not be the choice because they may help Marco Rubio may help them in Nevada and Arizona with the Latino votes, but that didn't happen. But Trump's campaign believed because J.D. Vance came from a very humble beginning in a old America in the rural America with very very tough childhood, so he can relate to voters in Michigan in Wisconsin and those places where these are swing states. So they both have their strategies. But again, I think that Democrats cannot capitalize on big victories because an average American only cares for how much money is it in my pocket at the end of the day. Can I send my kids to college? Can I buy a house? Can I pay my rent? Can I put food on my table? And, and when you cannot talk about that, then you can talk about identity politics, but it doesn't help people. Right, uh, these issues that you've just mentioned, Mr. Thirimzi, when we talk about the Republican strategy to deal or address these issues, uh, do they carry a very strong message? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, what happened was that whether by design, whether by the policies of Obama or uh, by policies of Donald Trump, however it was, the challenge always was that when, um, so for example, they talked about Dow Jones industrial average, the highest it has been. Problem is that 50% of Americans are not investing in the stock market. So yeah, maybe retirements account for 50% of Americans is good, but the other 50% are not. So when uh, Donald Trump was the president, the gas prices was around $2 a gallon. Now it's almost three fifty a gallon. So an average American is not invested in the stock market, but an average American will say, well, when the Trump was president, we were paying, you know, dollar fifty less per gallon at the pump, and that makes a difference because I may be paying less for my gas. When Donald Trump was the president, my groceries were forty percent cheaper. So I may be paying forty percent more for groceries. So people remember these small things that affect your pocket right away. People don't remember these or don't care or cannot relate that how much money stock market has done and how the trade is gone. These are very high level conversation. An average voter really at the end of the day cares about is my life better or worse? And when you pay more for groceries and may pay for more for rent and pay more for uh, housing and, and, and gas, that's an average voter understands. And Donald Trump can go back and say, look, 
you're better off under me. What has Biden done? Right. Mr. Trimzi, one last very important point. Now, this dismissal of the classified documents case, how bigger it, it's a victory for former President Donald Trump and how bigger an impetus it is going to give to his presidential campaign? Well, so here is the thing, right? An average American is not tuned in, tuned into these things. So, you know, I, I I move around political circles. So this is a conversation in a lot of the circles that I'm in. But outside of that, if I ask hundred of my closest friends and family members, what do you think about that? They would not even know there was a case, or if there was a case, what was the case? And what did he do wrong? And they may have some inkling to say, oh, yeah, I may have heard that they took the document, but they have no idea. Again, Democrats are so focused on a very high-level conversation who only are known by people who are in political circles, where Republicans are talking to an average American. A simple message, which everybody understands. And at the end of the day, that's where Democrats are going to lose, because their message is so high-level. And for people who are in political circles, that an average American is completely disconnected with that. Was there not any sort of legal implications as to the candidate, uh, candidacy of uh, Donald Trump is concerned if this particular case was not dismissed? Well, look, they charged him and they convicted him on 34 counts in New York, right? 34 counts he was convicted in. And uh, at this point, if you think about it, he is a convicted president, right? But as American system is, they have a right to appeal. It's going to go back into the courts. He's not going to get, uh, you know, they tried him on 34 counts and they convicted him on 34 counts. That's a very, very big deal that he has conviction on 34 different counts on uh, Stormy Daniel case, the hush money case. But again, the problem comes back to does an average American cares for these things to understand? And the reality is no. That's a very simple answer. No, they don't care, especially Trump supporters. Trump supporters really don't care for these things. Trump supporters know that when he's going to come, he's going to make America prosper again. He's going to make America look better. Um, you know, and Trump makes claims that are simple. He said, I'm going to come to the office on the first day I'm going to start Russia and Ukraine. First day I'm going to stop Russian and Ukraine war. And people just understand. It's a simple message. He's going to come to the office and stop the war. That's it. So that Democrats have a challenge, messaging challenge, huge messaging challenge and huge candidate challenge. No matter what they throw at Trump, whether it was a conviction, whether, the, you know, uh, uh, impeachment while he was president twice, no matter what they have tried. He had at the one point 100 and I think 26 different charges uh, against him. And nothing has stopped. Nothing has been, you know, nothing can stick because his message is that, you know, they want me. And he said it once. He said, the, the, uh, between you and your prosperity, I'm the only one. So they got to take me out. And the message is that for you to do better, I have to be into the mix. And that message resonates with the majority of America. Terimzi Sinal is joining us from the U.S., joining us on Skype. Thank you very much for taking time out for Views and News tonight. We really appreciate that. We are also honored uh, to have been joined in the studio by another participant, Mr. Sirfaz Ahmed Rana, Rana, foreign affairs expert. Mr. Rana, thank you very much for your time, for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. This assassination attempt on the life of former President Donald Trump, do you think it's going to uh, give an impetus and galvanize the supporters for Trump? Yeah, before I make a comment on directly on your question, I would like to uh, just give you a brief, uh, like, you know, uh, that I would say the, the pit Trump digged uh, for his political opposition, he himself fell into it. Why, Trump because fell into it? F the fell into it. I mean, okay. why? Because the Trump, uh, the assassination attempt which is being made on uh, Trump's life, right? Okay. Why? Because if you look at the Trump history of, uh, you know, instigating the violence in uh, the, you know, in the U.S. Capital? modern, uh, political history so it is uh, clear and it is obvious that you know how through certain you know tweets he has been and he had been inciting violence which led further to the banning of his twitter account and it stay it stand you know banned for a very mm -hmm. long period of time uh, number one number two uh, you know uh, trump is also a kind of pioneer uh, in introducing the culture of political radicalization in the modern uh, you know social and political fabric of united states of america I mean, kind of his political approach we had uh, seen, uh, he had been manifesting for a very long period of time. Right. 
And you know, uh, one of the best thing uh, where we can study his mind and brain, uh, in order to read uh, Trump's mind, uh, you just simply just go and read his book, which he had written back in 1980s, uh, The Art of the Deal, in which he basically uh, confesses uh, that you know being controversial and being radical uh, you know is a good thing that keeps your chances alive in politics and in business as well i mean that is that is something that he writes in his book right the art of the deal so that's that's quite uh, you know uh, very important that he can go to any length now you know i would come to you know explain that you know of course whether he is going to uh, uh, you know benefit uh, from this uh, uh, assassination attempt why because you know, w we are living again, you know, I come um, back to that conceptual and theoretical debate I would like to discuss about the rise of populism, you know, uh, at global level. Right, you know, whenever there is something like that, it happens like, you know, uh, 2019, Modi has conducted some airstrikes in Pakistan. I mean, it was, a, it was a very expensive gamble he had played, but he won the elections. And, you know, there had been certain other political uh, figures. Uh, which are following the you know the brand of politics which we uh, now call it uh, the you know the populism politics right so of course you know uh, from this there will be a sympathy card in the in the, uh, at the local level um, as you know uh, mr Uther has been explaining that the average voter count that you know he somehow gained that sympathy card as well uh, number one number two uh, on the other side we see that you know there had been no energy being manifested from democrats uh, Republic, uh, a Republican can take benefit from that element as well. Why? Because uh, President Biden has been facing, there are reports that there are, there are certain problems of dementia and some other problems, right? So there are no literal energy has been being poured into the American elections from, uh, from, uh, from Democrat side. So that become a plus point for the Republicans as well, right? Uh, so yeah, simply, I mean, uh, they, are, uh, they are at a very ideal situation. I mean, Donald Trump uh, is is at a very uh, this assassination attempt will become a plus point for him. Also, uh, you know, another thing which is being uh, uh, capitalized by the populist leader that is, of course, uh, that is their brand of politics in which they hit the right areas. For example, right areas including inflation, including you know immigration policies, some you know some other issues. So he has been, of course, you know. Uh, uh, reaching out to the minds and the and the brains of the American people, uh, hitting the right areas, for example, from inflation to other areas, right? And as Mr. Uther was talking about that, Democrats are basically talking about the high politics, for example, stock market and, you know, so on and so forth, w which is not close to the hearts of the average American voter. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Khalid, wasn't there any big achievement to show as far as the Democrats are concerned. When we talk about the, uh, at the outset of this particular presidential campaign, uh, was it related only to the age factor or the personality of the incumbent president, Joe Biden? Or were there things that could have been capitalized on to give that momentum or energy to this presidential campaign? <laughs> A difficult question. Uh, really, if you, if you look back, um, three years and three and a half years almost of Biden presidency. It is, um, it will be difficult to pick, you know, um, achievements or um, um, highlights that this is what the Americans can be uh, satisfied with during uh, Joe Biden presidency. Uh, <clears throat> But maybe this is not uh, the, uh, in a way, maybe not the critical factor. Uh, I remember Barack Obama, uh, who was president for eight years. He said, my regret is that there has been no increase in real wages in these eight years. But that's a big thing. So, you know, it's so easy to, to make stories and to make tall claims or um, saying that, all right, gas was much cheaper then and gas is much uh, ex more expensive now, but this is a phenomenon you cannot control. I don't think uh, uh, Trump could have controlled it. Uh, let's just keep in mind that there is a divide in America, divide between the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, right now, it seems that uh, the Republicans are riding a high tide and the uh, Democrats are in the dumps. 
uh, every which way. However, a lot will depend on mobilization of water supporters and uh, uh, whether how strongly the Democrat voters and they they want <laughs> they don't want to see Donald Trump back in the White House. Right. These are going to be the factors. Uh, so now with these immediate setbacks, uh, that dismal performance in the first presidential debate, now this particular assassination attempt on Donald Trump, of course getting that very sympathy from the supporters and the voters also, then dismissal of that particular case of the documents case by the uh, federal judge also. Uh, and then uh, there are polls that suggest that Republicans are leading in seven swing states. So with all these setbacks, is there any sort of a chance for the Democrats to gain ground from here on? Let's not rule out. Uh, and they say politics, uh, you know, a uh, week is a long time in politics. And we are like, you know, maybe um, 14 weeks away from elections. Things can happen. Things can change. Something else can come in, mm -hmm. um, which may have... Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't really... Uh, totally ignore the legal aspect, the cases, the convictions. Uh, something untoward could affect the campaign in that sphere. So um, I won't. I won't say that uh, his victory is a foregone conclusion. Uh, right. Uh, talking about uh, there's been uh, the talk uh, and pressure uh, on President Biden to step aside as a presidential candidate because of the age factor and especially in the wake of that dismal performance of the first presidential debate. He has categorically said that he's not stepping aside. In that sort of a scenario, if continues to carry on uh, with this presidential campaign and contest the election from the Democrat side, what chances do you foresee? And if it doesn't happen to be any sort of a legal intervention or any sort of uh, uh, proceeding that could uh, adversely affect President Donald Trump. Again, uh, not not easy to you know to 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 forecast. Okay, if if that particular pressure keeps on building, and uh, the pressure to withdraw, to withdraw, and President Joe Biden steps aside, do you think that would be a good move at this particular point in time, or would it uh, help the Democrats? gain momentum from here onwards to uh, have a You know, uh, if he's doing some soul searching and at some point soon, that is soon enough, he reaches the conclusion that, uh, you know, it is not worth it to continue in the race. That's the only thing. Otherwise, his mind is set. He will not quit. And uh, one of the reasons is that for anybody, any new candidate to come on the scene and to mobilize support and the funding aspects and all these things um, looks very difficult. This is going to be quite an uphill task. Very, very Mr. Much. Rana, what's your understanding? Very is there an alternative as a Democrat's candidate if, if by any chance President Joe Biden steps aside or withdraws from the candidates? Uh, I would say that, you know, what the rule book of the game says, that, you know, do not change your horses in the middle of the game. So if you are just uh, changing your horses in the middle of the game, it will not, uh, you know, benefit you in any way. It will definitely come to hurt you. So I would say as, uh, your, as far as your con question is concerned that, you know, whether uh, this move will, uh, uh, you know, benefit the Re Democrats. So I, 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 I highly and seriously doubt that this kind of move uh, will be benefited by the Democrats now, yeah. So, so in that sort of a scenario, if it happens, if it happens, if he steps aside and withdraws, you're of the view, everyone is of the view that the Democrats are not going to be getting that mobilization, that support during the next couple of months till the polls happen. Then how bigger a disaster it could be for the Democrats in the future? Uh, you know, um, if you just uh, try to look at uh, the organizational structure of Democrats, 
there is even an opposition uh, within Democrats against Biden and there is a um, you know constant pressure against Biden to withdraw within their organizational structure of Democrats. Uh, why? Because of uh, because he's aging, you know, age factor, dementia. He forgets things quite easily, and you know, and Trump is uh, you know targeting him that you know uh, a man uh, such uh, you know with such a mindset, and uh, you know a sick man should not be you know deciding in the matters of national security and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, so uh, yeah. So is there any roadmap the Republicans have come up with? in order to address all those challenges the American public is faced with right now? And what happens to be those three key challenges the Americans think should be addressed right after the new president comes into office? As far as my understanding uh, about Donald Trump uh, is that, you know, uh, uh, any populist leader has never been a part of solution. You know, it, uh, you know he has always been a part of problem. Uh, my understanding as far as and you know as far as uh, the important thing as you are asking that you know what should be the three priorities and preferences of the American voters uh, that they are expecting the Donald Trump or will come. put in that way what could be the three key challenges for the new president as soon as he uh, comes into the office? Uh, the, the three key challenge I would say you know on the foreign policy account uh, of course the uh, Palestine issue will be the main challenge. Uh, number one, number two, uh, you know why? Because the wages uh, going down and inflation going up, that will be another important challenge. The third challenge, I would say, and uh, you know, to my understanding, the third will be the political divide and the political polarization within the American society. Uh, the third and the fourth, uh, I would add, you know, that will be the legal uh, legal thing that you know why? Because he's being convic convicted on 34 counts, right? Okay, so so that is the legal challenge. You know how he, they are going to cope up with the legal side as well. So that's that's another fourth so challenge. So compared well. foreign policy front and the other issues that are faced at home. So which one of the two carries more weight as far as the impact on the overall election results is concerned? Uh, I think uh, as far as I mean it's 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 bit bit difficult to draw conclusion and you know just to give an analysis but I would just go for the uh, one I would consider the foreign policy why because uh, Donald Trump again is uh, if this issue w is not addressed like you know mm -hmm. the, the the way uh, this issue is going so of course you know there, w there will be a constant pressure uh, the Palestine issue Palestine. the Gaza issue sure. yeah. oh, okay I'll come back to you uh, Mr. Khalid when we talk about the foreign policy front and its impact or the kind of line a certain political uh, party, either uh, Republicans or Democrats or its presidential candidate does carry along, as compared to the issues or challenges faced at home, which one carries more weight as far as in terms of its impact on the election results is concerned? I feel that the uh, you know economic issues, um, domestic issues, <coughs> We are not so familiar with the uh, American, you know, scene. Uh, so we always talk in terms of, uh, you know, uh, capacity to buy goods. That is the yardstick. That is your purchasing power going up or is it going down? If it is going down, how badly it is going down? But uh, uh, things do get connected, uh, willingly, unwillingly. Uh, I remember when Trump had uh, come as president, he started, you know, blasting China, that they are taking away our jobs, and we will bring these jobs back. But that's a very expensive exercise. In a highly developed economy with very high ba wages, how do you bring jobs back? And if you just apply a lot of tariffs, a lot of restrictions, you know what happens? It's the American consumer who suffers. He had, a, he had a choice to buy cheaper goods, which is, which is being denied to him. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's hit directly, and uh, his purchasing capacity goes down. So uh, things can get, you know, get connected without, without realizing. Okay, so, so Mr. Ram, when you talk about the Palestinian issue, the Gaza, uh, the situation as it is unfolding over there in Gaza, uh, what sort of a shift do you see if President Trump comes into the office again? Uh, I don't see that you know he will come uh, because given his history uh, declaring Tel Aviv uh, uh, and Jerusalem you know the capital of uh, Israel so I would not see that you know he will come and uh, you know 
uh, give some relief to the Gazans and, the, and you know, will provide some solution to the Palestine. And also, I would uh, share the similar views uh, with the Ambassador Saab that you know why, because in his previous uh, administration, he had literally started a trade and economic battle with China and, you know, uh, fighting two largest economy at a global level, right? That means an economic disaster, not only for China, not only for United States, but for the global economy, uh, but for the global trade and global economy and fr from the global goods, right? So that's quite, I mean, a trade volume that is reaching close to $1 trillion between the two nations, United States of America and China. So, you know, picking up a, bite, picking up a battle with China, that will be a really expensive battle, I, I tell you, not only for China and United States, but, you know, for, uh, for international world as well. So yeah. as far as the uh, situation in Gaza is concerned, you don't see any big shift no. even Donald Trump comes into power. Uh, uh, Mr. Khalid, do you have any uh, understanding as to how President Trump, if he comes back into office, would operate as far as the situ current situation in Gaza is concerned? What I, uh, <clears throat> what I can you know, imagine is that uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump is a uh, rather forceful character. And his handling will be different. Um, he boasts, I can finish the Ukraine war mm -hmm. in no time. But I think he can finish the violence in Gaza in no time. Okay, if he so wants, he can. Okay. He has that kind of, you know, uh, mental kind of... So what, what it would take for can, him to do that? He just has to order Netanyahu. Okay. I mean, it may sound and, very and simple, and but he has that it power. It would be as simple as um, it would be complied with. America has that power. Which Biden has not been able to apply okay. and not get results. Okay. All we hear is more arms, more money uh, for Israel. That's not. I don't think that's so, a very. So, so, very uh, that's pretty much doable. Just passing an order and asking Netanyahu to stop it. It's going to be as simple no, as that. No, but no, what sort of gain do you think would be associated if Trump no, goes for it's that? Particular? Not, it's not as simple as giving an order, but you know, it is what makes a difference between leaders who are effective and leaders who talk a lot. And let's not forget, it was Donald Trump who said, we are going to put an end to these unending wars. So what about the uh, crisis in, the, uh, in Ukraine? What about the crisis? He, he had said out of Afghanistan, right. which Biden completed. Okay. So. Uh, I think his attitude will be the same, whether it is Ukraine or it is violence in Gaza. Uh, I think he can be effective. Right. Uh, Mr. He Rana, has shown it. Any, any sort of difference? Uh, you already mentioned that you don't foresee any, any big shift if President Trump comes back into office as far as the resolution of the Palestinian conflict or the situation in Gaza is concerned. What about uh, the crisis in Ukraine? Do these both presidential candidates carry the same line as far as the situation in Ukraine is concerned? Or do uh, they Just think differently? Just one second. Biden has lost popularity over this Palestine. Palestine issue. Yes. I, I would say, uh, you know, before commenting on this Ukraine thing, I agree to the ambassadors uh, to the extent that America, if they will, uh, Donald Trump, if he wills, can end the violence in Gaza. But Donald Trump coming back to the Oval Office means that Jewish lobby is strengthening, you know, over the White House, his uh, son-in-law and all those things, right? Mm -hmm. One of the important things. And also, if violence ends, I repeat, uh, Jawad, if violence ends, it will end on Israeli terms and conditions. So that's quite interesting. Like, you know, if the violence ends, it will end on the terms and conditions defined and set by the Israel. Uh, and what? as far as the Netanyahu's uh, attitude is concerned, uh, Netanyahu is a spoiled and stubborn kid. He does not listen to anybody. He does one not listen to anybody. Point. Please go ahead. One Mr. last point. Mr. Khalid, please. That uh, Donald Trump uh, may be very pro-Israel, uh, but <laughs> it is Biden who landed in Tel Aviv and said, I'm a Zionist. Trump never did that. Uh, uh, what about the Ukraine crisis? 
Uh, I mean, again, you know, it's 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 very hard to predict why because the, the given the kind of uh, based on the statements given, given based on the statements already given by uh, Donald Trump. You know, there is always a difference between you know rhetorics and the delivering on substance. Why? Because given his uh, close bromance between pr pr Putin and uh, uh, you know Donald Trump, so I would say that you know if violence ends in Ukraine, it will again you know somewhere more win victory to the Russia. Russia will not leave all the territories which are occupied currently, right? So there will be something win-lose situation and Ukraine has to lose again. What about again. Donald Trump's policy towards NATO? Uh, I think his policy will be definitely, uh, will not be quite cordial towards NATO as we had seen. He has de uh, de demonstrated. Uh, through his foreign policy and he would like to like you know disown the NATO disown all the like why because we can see that he had made a comments in the past that we cannot become a global policeman so or global watchman implications right? of that on the overall Ukraine crisis, the crisis and the situ uh, and the situation that would arise for Vladimir Zelensky in particular in uh, that kind of a scenario yeah the situation will not be really good for uh, Zelensky if the t Donald Trump if comes I in office. Have, uh, 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 Please uh, go ahead, Mr. Khan. That, uh, <clears throat> it's a, you know, it's a different style. Trump's style is corporate style. And corporate style goes for decisions and results. Whereas traditional politicians, they get enmeshed in all kinds of, you know, uh, things. So that, that's what I meant when I say that he can... Got your point, Mr. Sayyid Khalid, former ambassador. Thank you very, very much Welcome. for joining us in the studio. Mr. Safraz Ahmed Rana, foreign affairs expert. Thank you very much for your time also for being with us on the show tonight. Really appreciate that. With that, we come to the end of today's episode. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.